Katie Helper. Why'd you pause? I was saying if you jump in and say, I'm Marin Mate, I was really leaving this, I was holding the space for you in case you want to do that. So I'm going to come as you're talking, I'm going to come in and say my name before you've even said your, no, no, I, I wouldn't do that. You wouldn't do that, all right. <laughs> well, I was, I just wanted to mix it up a little bit. Okay. I mean, there's so many ways we could do it. Yeah. It could be, hello, welcome to Idiots. Well, you could say, welcome indeed. Welcome indeed. Yeah, no, yeah, no, <laughs> I, I don't see it. I don't see it. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I'm Aaron Matcha. That's my name. That's and, his uh, name, yeah. Good to be here, yeah. Good to be yeah. here. Good to see you. How's it going? Yeah. Good, good. How are you? Good. Welcome back to the United States of America. Thank you. Land Thank you. of the home of the free, land of the brave, land of the free, home of the brave. How does it feel? It feels good. I, you know, had a great time with my parents. I visited them for a while and um, got a lot done. And, uh, you know, but it's going to be back. It's going to be yeah. back. Back in the, in the grind. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, we have a great show for you today. Uh, we have the uh, esteemed Katrina Vanden Heuvel of The Nation magazine, real Russia expert. She even speaks Russian. Yes, she does. Katrina has been covering Russia for several decades now. It was a major part of uh, her uh, reporting career to this date. And obviously, you know, the focus of her late husband, Stephen F. Cohen, the uh, eminent Russia scholar. And with so much going on right now, the U.S. war machine escalating war fever with Russia, you know, we couldn't think of a better person to speak to than Katrina. Yeah, so we're very excited about that. And let's just get into the uh, four basic food groups. Democrats suck, Republicans suck. Isn't that weird? Isn't that terrible? Let's do it. I got let's down do it. this week. Ooh, so okay. uh, let's go. Um, I thought we could do something from kind of Democrat, blue state uh, media, if you will. Democratic media, and that, of course, is very much exemplified by CNN. And we had an interesting uh, response to the latest Joe Rogan Spotify controversy from an uh, honorary friend of show, because we talk about him almost every Monday morning, uh, Brian Stelter. So let's take a look at this clip. The narrative is, I want to show all kinds of opinions. Which sounds great, but not all opinions are created equal. You think about major newsrooms like CNN that have health departments and deaths and operations that work hard on verifying information on COVID-19. And then you have talk show stars like Joe Rogan who just wing it, who make it up as they go along. And because figures like Rogan are trusted by people that don't trust real newsrooms, we have a tension, a problem that's much bigger than Spotify, much bigger than any single platform, Kate. But that's what the, is the heart of this right now. Yeah, but you're right. It is getting at something bigger that isn't going to be solved in one Joe Rogan video or one statement from Spotify. That's for sure. It's good to that's see right. you, Brian. Thank you so much. There's a lot to talk about here. One is the response to Rogan. We have more celebrities who are saying you got the the your Canadian brother, uh, Nick, uh, Neil Young, who has left Spotify in a kind of really embarrassing move where he threatened to remove his content if they didn't remove Rogan's. And duh, they didn't remove Rogan. <laughs> He's like one of their biggest draws. And so Neil Young, putting his money where his mouth is, I guess, uh, left Spotify. Then he was followed up by Joni Mitchell. Is she also a Canuck? Damn right she is, yeah. Wow, okay. So yeah. then we got two Canadian. I mean, may this is becoming kind of a na uh, uh, nationalistic, <laughs> nationalist thing. War could break out. War could break out between yeah. the two North American nations. Yeah. Yeah. So we got uh, Joni Mitchell, which I know this is going to be controversial, but I fucking hate that song, River. It's so bad. This is one of her. I don't know River. It's by it's, Joni Mitchell. It starts off with like a Jingle Bells type of song. Okay. Like playing it on the piano. And it's bad enough. And then uh, I'm going to get canceled for this, but I'm not going to get canceled for this part, which is that Sarah McLaughlin took something bad and made it even worse. Oh, hmm. another Canadian. Another Canadian, yeah. Wow, you guys have some interesting people coming out of your- Yeah, hell yeah. Of your shop. Honestly, if I'm Spotify, I'm just kind of so annoyed by that song. Wow. Maybe, I, may, I may be relieved to see Joni Mitchell leave. By River, wow. By River, yeah. Think, about, mean, that, think about that catalog though. I know, I guess I should be, yeah. I, I, I mean, mean, I also don't like Pave Paradise and put up a parking lot. So corny. Really? I okay. like the message. Uh-huh. Interesting Paradise. contempt for Joni Mitchell, Katie. This is, and you, but you also love the Indigo Girls, right? right. It's off a little off-brand, right? Because I love and the where would they, I mean, I, I, I assume they were heavily influenced by Joni Mitchell. Were they musically, or are they just kind of like, is there just a Venn diagram in terms of taste? Right, maybe that's it. Yeah. 
You know my other controversial view, which will very much upset you, which is that I basically dislike all of Stevie Wonder's very popular songs. Wow. But I don't dislike him. <laughs> yeah, I, I gotcha. I love that song, I believe when I fall in love with you, it'll be forever. Uh-huh. But that part of the reason I love that is it happens to not be as popular as Signed, Sealed, Delivered. I understand. Uh, my Sharia more. I understand. You're a deep yeah. cut enthusiast for, I'm a for deep Stevie. Cut enthusiast for you don't Stevie, want those, yeah. you don't want those milk toast pop hits. Yeah. I find them like really unpleasant to listen to, though. It's not, it's not me you being must, a snob. It's just like, ugh. You must hate. I just called to say I love you. Yeah, I do. Yeah. It's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I look, see, in the case of Joni Mitchell and Neil Young, I it's hard for me. Well, first of all, I personally love their all their catalogs. Yeah. Um, especially Neil you know, who yeah. was such a big part of my musical upbringing. And in their cases, look, they both had polio when they were kids. So I imagine that really informs their their thinking now. And right. um, Wait, are you saying they have brain damage because of their polio? <laughs> I'm not saying that. I mean, no, I'm not. no, I'm saying they're especially yeah, sensitive sure. to, to, to vaccine skepticism. My right. issue, though, is first of all, it's, uh, I mean, to me, it's, it's hypocritical to go after Joe Rogan, who um, is a podcast host, when you have corporate media outlets putting out misinformation as their oh, no. job every single right. day that kills far more people. Uh, and in the case of Joe Rogan, I'm not even sure exactly what he's done in terms of what he's put out there that is so egregious. Now, granted, I haven't listened to his show, so maybe I'm missing something. Right. But I just think this attempt to target him uh, when he's a podcast host, that to me is strange. And certainly groups like Move On that are trying to get him removed from uh, Spotify. And there are even some White House officials who have you know, suggested that he should be removed. That to me is just crazy because that's advocating open censorship. When it comes to right. Joni Mitchell and Neil Young, like they have sure. the right have to the right not to be on it. Yeah. 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 You know. I just felt bad for Neil Young because I thought it was a P. It was like. No, you know what, though? If I'm Neil Young, maybe I'm like, I, I wear that as a badge of honor, I guess. They won't remove this guy, so I'm leaving. I think I thought maybe he expected that they would they would capitulate and remove You think him. so? <laughs> yeah, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm totally misunderstood. Maybe Young is a much more just prince. I mean, he strikes me as incredibly principled. So I'm going to I'm gonna change. Thank you, Aaron. You just changed my mind uh, on that. I think it was probably a, a solid move on Neil Young's part. Well, I'm going to flip it because uh, I'm not I'm not endorsing Neil's move. I just have to the extent he's influenced by having polio as a kid and he's sensitive about any kind right. of vaccine issues. I, I'm just saying I'm trying to be empathetic with him. Right. At the same time, at the same time, he has a past of being a bigot. Like during the 1980s, he had some really homophobic comments about uh, gay people and AIDS. Really? So, yeah, he had a weird turn in the 80s, as many Whoa. musicians did. That changes um, everything, though. Yeah. But like being yeah. homophobic and bad on AIDS for a musician, that's like, I mean, he was the good guy in Sweet Home Alabama. He certainly was. It's uh, That's true. That's when he Southern was. Southern man. Don't Southern need, man. Yeah. Don't yeah. need you around. Well, so so that's what. So so he wrote Leonard Southern Skinner man said, and the right? Leonard Skinner wrote a song dissing him. Right. Um, Sweet Home Alabama. Very yeah, exactly. Song. Yes, very problematic. Yes. I wonder if so, that triggered him yeah. to like, I'll raise, I'll take your that bigotry and I'll raise it. I mean, who knows? I, I don't, yeah. you know. I mean, who knows? Like, what goes on in musicians' heads, and that's right. part of the problem too. Sometimes we we pay too much attention to celebrities and their opinions, and that can be unfortunate right. for everybody involved. But I guess what I'm saying is, I have empathy for all. I, I, yeah, yeah, sure. You know, Neil and Joni have the right to do it at the same time. When people like Brian Stelter pick up on this and try to claim a higher ground over Joe Rogan, that's just such a farce, given what right. CNN puts out every single day on every issue. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if, oh, maybe I'll get in trouble for this. I wouldn't be surprised if Joe Rogan is far more factual, even on the issue of COVID than CNN is, honestly. I, I wouldn't yeah. that I wouldn't that wouldn't surprise me. I'm not endorsing all of Joe Rogan's views right, on COVID because I don't know what they are, but I just find it hard to believe that he is um, putting out misinformation on a scale that surpasses CNN, which yeah. is a, a leading source of misinformation. If not on COVID, then on many other issues that impact people's lives, especially like war and peace. War, well, peace, Russia, any 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 single war that the U.S. is involved in. Yeah. Any single country that the U.S. is targeting with 
murderous sanctions. sanctions yeah. CNN will always be on the side of putting out propaganda on behalf of the U.S. Right. state, which is every day killing many people with his policies. Right. True. Yes. Also, it's just such a moment of, I mean, the question is even, and I, this has been raised by people who even who dislike Rogan, who in some ways have the most to benefit from asking this question, which is like, well, why is he so successful? What is the media not providing or what is the media doing to have the establishment media, the non-podcast, the like straight news, reported news, what are they doing that makes so many people turn to Rogan? Um, and also what is Rogan doing? Like, what can the media do that Rogan does? But, uh, in terms of what he's doing as a media figure, they probably have a lot to learn from him and also a lot of introspection to do. It's just, it's such a lack of awareness, I guess, um, to, to say the problem is that people take him seriously and not us without looking at where that's coming from. Rogan is not a partisan hack. Refreshing. Which di which then like distinguishes him from pretty much anybody who works in cable news, whether you're right. on Fox or you're on CNN or MSNBC. I mean, the basis for all that is partisan hackery. And uh, he has an open mind, I think. That's my impression yeah, yeah. of him. He does speak to people who have different views than him. And that also sets him apart from right. anybody. Like, you know, for example, during Russiagate on MSNBC, if you didn't think that Vladimir Putin was controlling the U.S. via blackmail of Trump, then you just couldn't go on. You couldn't right. provide it. And still, that, that that's still the case now. And same thing with um, the current drumbeat for war with Russia. Anybody with a dissenting view, you won't see them on any of the Sunday news shows that we suffered through every single week for Monday morning. Right. You know, so I think that kind of um, that kind of hackery is what has turned people off corporate media and has led people to embrace voices like uh, Joe Rogan's. But there's another kind of attempted cancellation. Now, this that's an attempted cancellation that hasn't really worked because he's not going anywhere. Although he has had said, like, he'll try to do a better job of having multiple voices on. Yeah. Um, but we got to talk a little bit about Whoopi Goldberg, who got into trouble because on The View, in the context, to be fair, she was saying that the the book Mouse, which is a great graphic uh, book by Art Spiegelman about his parents, about himself. His parents survived the Holocaust. And there is a scene where his mother is nude and she's not drawn as a mouse. So there's human nudity. Now, I don't care. I'm just saying that because I'm just fact checking it because a lot of people are like, who cares if it's a naked mouse? Now, I don't think you should care it's a naked human. But anyway, just so you know, so you can make your, your pro-mouse argument more strongly, she happens to be human. Anyway, you barely see it. It's just a breast or two that you see. And uh, I think kids can handle it, though. So there's this movement to ban mouse um, because it has that one image of a semi-nude person. But, but most people think it's really because it's kind of an, you know, Con condemns Nazism. It's anti-Holocaust. It's anti-Nazi. Whoopi Goldberg, in defending Mouse and and you know pushing back against these attempted censorship of Mouse, said something about the Holocaust not being about race. She didn't like start with that, but someone said something about racism, and and she's like, but it's not even it's not about that. It's not even about that. It's two white groups. It's about hate which got people very upset because I think they thought that she was downplaying the racialized element of the Holocaust. And then she wrote, she tweeted, I'm a little upset. She tweeted and quoted John Goldblatt uh, from the Anti-Defamation League, which is a bigoted organization that claims to be anti-bigotry. Um, that's a whole other discussion, but they're kind of like APAC in their politics, very hawkish, anti-Palestinian. Uh, while pretending to be kind of social justice uh, defenders. But uh, she quoted him as saying that, you know, basically that Hitler saw Jews as a different race, which, duh, that's like Nazism 101. Speaking of curriculum, maybe we got to start assigning Mein Kampf to read that, obviously, as like a historical document, you know, not propaganda. Then she went on Colbert and like apologized, but I got to say her apology was pretty bad. Because it was basically like, I learned my lesson. I'm not going to say that stuff again. It was like a passive aggressive. While her tweet very much said, like, I I've now understand 
you know, I see that, you know, Hitler, of course, Hitler did see Jews as a different race. Like if she had said that, but she kind of went on the Colbert report and they pulled some strings because she managed to go on the Colbert report literally the day she made the comments on The View. And she squandered that, I think, opportunity because she went on and she made some very interesting points about like visibility, saying that, you know, if the Klan shows up and they see her and they see, you know, she's standing with the Jewish friend and, and they'll pass the Jewish friend over and go to her. So she was speaking to kind of the visibility um, issue of, of race. And for her, obviously, race means black and white, which it does in the American context. I think the problem is that it kind of downplayed the extent to which Jews have historically been otherized and racialized. And that at the same time, though, doesn't mean that white Jews don't have white privilege. So those are the things that I think need to be in our heads at the same time. And now she's suspended. I think, Two it's, weeks. I think it's insane that she was suspended. All the things that people say that are offensive, you know, right. especially in the U.S. context about Muslims. That's the most, right. I think, yeah, dehumanized the yeah. ethnic group. Um, and she gets suspended for, you know, what I think we're actually, I got what she was saying. From her point of view, she sees white people as a, you know, as a grouping. And so Monolith, she just sees, yeah. yeah. And, and, and so she sees basically two different strands of the same race, whatever you want to call it, uh, in the Holocaust context. And so that's why she's saying it's not about different yeah. races. Like, it's, I mean, to me, it, 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 it all, it's all about how you define race. And right. I mean, first of all, like the term race itself is, well, that's is problematic. Right. But but the point is, like, I got what she was saying and to suspend her for it. Um, I mean, I, I think was it was it was I, I, it was it was embarrassing to me because to me, it furthers this I know. stereotype that basically like where, you know, Jews have powerful roles in the media, which is I true, <laughs> which which, which is true. And then they also police right. the way know, people talk about them, about them. And, you know, and you can say things about any ethnicity except except for Jews. That's right. That's the impression that it will um bolster among certain people yeah and there's and there's I, an element of there's an element of truth to it yeah, there is right and i find that embarrassing especially when the, the only the only it, like i'm jewish myself right but the only uh area of holocaust and jewish talk that i'm interested in if you're a holocaust survivor i i, I always want to hear about your experience you know to and and oh, that aaron has an open line no i do i but like but the, like the, but the problem is the holocaust is so the way it's discussed it so often demeans the actual experience of the holocaust right. and it's used for political purposes namely to whitewash what israel does right. to palestinians the way it's you know Weaponized. The way it's discussed is, is, is the way it's weaponized is it's really it, it's really cheap. And also the way it uses to distract from the actual atrocity going on today, which is what Israel does, is also a major problem. So basically what I'm saying is if there's a discussion that we had in the public domain about like Jewish issues or the Holocaust, right. the only context in which I'm personally interested in hearing it is if you're a Holocaust or ever talking about what happened to you or if you're criticizing what Israel is doing. Otherwise, yeah. All this other stuff is just most of the time, in my, in my opinion, a yeah. distraction and a actually cheapening of what the Holocaust actually was. Shutting people up in the media is an embarrassing thing. It makes it look like we control the media. And so maybe actually ABC is the, the anti-Semite because they're perpetuating this anti-Semitic trope. Maybe they need to be suspended for two weeks. I hear that. Let's do All that of for ABC sure. Programming. ABC, yes. you're suspended for two weeks, two weeks off yeah. air, the whole network for perpetuating the anti-Semitic stereotype that Jews control the media. Well, OK, so that was my uh, that was our Democrats suck. All right. Well, on to Republicans suck. We have a familiar face, a guy by the name of DJT. Let's hit it. If these radical, vicious, racist prosecutors do anything wrong or illegal, I hope we are going to have in this country the biggest protest we have ever had in Washington, D.C., in New York, in Atlanta, and elsewhere, because our country and our elections are corrupt. They're corrupt. We're in the midst of just a profound ego trip crisis in this country from our political leaders. And it, it is bipartisan. Hillary Clinton lost in 2016, but a stubborn refusal to 
have any humility and do some self-reflection on why she lost helped lead to four years of blaming Russia, right? And blaming everybody else but herself and her campaign. And now Trump is doing the same thing. He lost in 2020. He came up with this fake fantasy that it was because of uh, a massive conspiracy to defraud him and deny him the victory and it involved Venezuelan voting machines and communist uh, influence from China and all this crazy stuff. And he's still ongoing. And now it's like his main thing. And what's funny to me is like politically, he's like throwing away the one thing that worked for him, which was pretending to be a working class champion. Democrats suck so bad that Trump, <laughs> this uh, like very rich person, I don't know if he's a billionaire, but extremely wealthy man was able to pretend that he uh, supports the working class. And that worked for him. It, it, it had basically helped win in the election in 2016. But he's so um, ego driven and narcissistic that now the fact that he lost in 2020 is enough for him to trigger him into this like multi on, ongoing multi month meltdown where all, all he can talk about is voter fraud. And now he's apparently being investigated for uh you know for many things in new york there's investigations of a trump organization and he's still facing the january 6th investigation for inciting the riots that happened and so that's all that can occupy his mind and he's like whipping up his supporters into this frenzy about this voter fraud thing and trying to call for what he calls the biggest protest in u.s history as if this is the most important cause ever, this fantasy he's created of, of, of voting fraud. And Republicans are in an awkward state because they they know he's full of shit, but he is the leader of the party. So no one is still no one in a prominent position is really willing to to call him out forcefully. Uh, you know, Mitch McConnell sometimes says some stuff, but no one can really fully break with him because he is leader of their party. So right. it just it's his increasingly awkward meltdown. It reminds me a lot of uh, of Russiagate, which was similar and that no one was willing to call bullshit on Hillary Clinton. By the way, even Bernie Sanders wasn't willing to call bullshit right. on Russiagate. He went along with it. So it's it's amazing how ego trips, narcissistic e ego trips have a hold of both parties. And right now, the main driver is uh, is Donald Trump and the Republicans. Yeah, I mean, and it's racist, he says. Yeah, I don't know what that's about. I'm not sure how that works. Yeah. Yeah, he's taking a page from Democrats there. You know, he's sort of adopting their language to, uh, yeah, but I would love to know what are his, actually, I don't want to know, but, yeah. but it's funny to think about what are his possible grounds for thinking it's racist for him to be investigated. Right. Well, okay, so that's our Republican suck. I almost admire him for doubling down on that. I mean, he's been really accused, you know, he did a lot of destabilizing things by saying the elections were not legitimate. It does make Republicans look so ridiculous. And of course, Democrats aren't getting anything done. So they have, right. they have nothing really to um, show for themselves. Right. So it's, them, yeah. it's a good gift for them. In the same way that I thought Russiagate was a huge gift for Trump, now Trump is sort of repaying the kindness. It's, um, it's interesting how it plays out. Yeah. All right. So now let's go to Isn't That Weird? And this, if we could play the video, is a story about a, uh, a goose uh it says goose born with uh no eyes and half a beak uh we took nibbler in when he was a few days old uh he is blind he doesn't have any eyes at all but actually gets around pretty well the first thing he does in the morning is come out and swim in his turtle pool it's a very cute little turtle pool and uh you just see him splashing around in that cute little turtle pool he's scratching his neck Finally, he eats despite his beak. Um, and you just see the guy eating, in case you're just listening to this. But it looks like he has eyes. I guess they just don't work. Or are those just holes in there? I can't tell. Now you see him splashing around again. Anyway, Nibbler is very cute. And it's a, isn't that weird? Yes, half a beak, no eyes. But also, isn't that heartwarming? But you can make it if you are an eyeless, half-beaked goose. You can make it. And he's very cute. That is weird, but it is also heartwarming. I'm, um, I don't feel grossed out. I, I feel uh, warm and fuzzy. So that's right. a, you know, that's a nice kind of way to ingest weirdness. So 
But isn't that terrible? This is terrible. Man suffers from penile necrosis after injecting cocaine into his penis. Why would you do that? Well, why would you do that? Because he ran out of veins. That's why. Uh, um, a man has suffered from penile necrosis after injecting cocaine into his penis. His doctors have reported in the American Journal of Case Reports. The 35-year-old showed up at the emergency department following three days of intense penis and scrotal pain, as well as in his groin and right foot. Upon inspection, the team found that he had swelling of the penis, as well as necrosis, death of tissue, ulcers along the shaft, and foul-smelling discharge. I'm sorry, for everybody. This is so gross. It's so um, terrible. It's so gross. Gangrene was ruled out as were any sexually transmitted infections. And he was given antibiotics while the team cared for his wounds. It was suggested they cut away the dead tissue on his penis, which the man refused. However, after 15 days in the hospital, his wounds had improved and infection was contained. And, uh, you know, during his stay, he disclosed that he had a long history of drug use. He basically damaged other injection points in his body. So that's what he, he used. So that's terrible. I really feel for him. That's just awful. Yeah. That, that, you know, that really fits the bill this week for it. Isn't that terrible? And what really makes it sad is that um, after he uh, was discharged, no pun intended, uh, from the hospital, he refused drug rehab and was light, lost to the follow up. So that really is terrible because he has to get this habit under control. Fingers crossed he doesn't try the penis again. I think he's learned his lesson. Maybe I'm I'm hoping he uses a different drug, I guess, honestly, if he can't quit. That doesn't involve injection. To me, to me, it speaks to the importance of safe injection sites. One recently opened up on, in New on York the City. Body, both on the body. The oh, well, safe yeah. injection sites. But, yeah. You know, like a like a physical right. site where people people can go. There, you know, in sure. some countries, I I I get I bet they don't have it here in the US, although maybe I'm wrong, but I know in Canada. You can take your drugs to places. They can test it for you to oh, tell good. you it's it's purity, like you know wh what's in it and all that stuff. Right. I know they have that in Vancouver. I don't know if anywhere else, but th this speaks to the the need for things like that. And there are yeah. people who argue that you know safe injection sites uh, that they uh, encourage drug use and that they lead to more drug use. Yeah. And I mean, we, we don't need to get into that whole debate because I. Uh, to me, it's just so obvious that, I mean, think, the fact that someone is so addicted that they feel right. the need to inject into their penis just speaks to just how powerful addiction is and how instead of criminalizing it, you need to show compassion for it and give people right. the safest conditions possible to do what they're going to do anyway. No one should have to inject anything into their penis. No. Well, that is so terrible. I'm willing to never speak about that story uh, again. And I... I, I I hope that guy's okay. Yeah, me too. So our guest this week is Katrina Vandenhuvel. She is the publisher and editorial director of The Nation magazine. A longtime student, scholar, journalist on Russia issues, has been going there for many years and has a lot to say about what is currently happening with the war fever in Washington towards Moscow. Let's go to Katrina Vandenhuvel. so honored and excited to be talking to Katrina Vanden Heuvel. You are just such an expert and a brave voice when it comes to talking about this, these issues of Russia, Ukraine, war and peace in general. And you're also you, you're someone who, who has studied the history of these regions. And I wanted to ask you a kind of basic question, but if you just fill people in on the history of NATO, because I think a lot of people don't understand what NATO does what it functions as and why it was formed in the first place. First of all, thank you for having me on, Katie and Aaron. And I'm not, I don't know if anyone's an expert at this point, but I certainly care about the outcome of U.S.-Russian relations. NATO is the supreme Cold War instrument founded at the end of, you know, at the end of the, the, the Cold, 46, 47. And it was a military, it's a military institution which brought together countries to forge the security and peace of the West. It was accepted. And then the Russian Soviet Union had its Warsaw Pact was the equivalent, the counterpoint, the counterpart to NATO. 
So in when the Soviet Union ends in 1990-91, there is a question as to why NATO still exists because the Warsaw Pact collapsed. The famous and the grave sin, and I think one of the escalating factors behind what we're witnessing today was in 1990, when in Berlin, uh, Gorbachev agreed to the reunification of Germany, which was a big step. And uh, he was promised by George H.W. Bush and James Baker, and this is documented, their books, their primary documents at the National Security Archives in Washington, D.C., that NATO would not, quote, move, move one inch eastward. Well, it did. And there was also a big fight in 1997 in this country about NATO expansion. It was a healthy fight. In fact, you had two hands clapped off in these days around issues, U.S. Russian. But in a famous interview with Tom Friedman said it would be the gravest error of the post-Cold War era, not post, but it would lead to conflict with the Soviet Union, with Russia. So Warsaw Pact goes away. NATO gets stronger and stronger. It had 13 countries. In 2008, it fast-tracked Ukraine and Georgian uh, entrance, but that's been put on hold. It, has, it also, in 1990, closed out for a brief moment, and I believe in alternatives and life of politics, the possibility of an alternative security architecture in Europe that would not have been militarized might have been EU, not the greatest institution or the organization for security and development in Europe, but NATO dominated partly, and I'll stop, it is no coffee clutch, as people have said. It's not even ARP meeting. I used to say it's no tea party, but that doesn't work anymore. But the budget is strong. Those who enter have to be have weapon compatible weapon systems. So there's a boondoggle for the military industrial complex in NATO itself as a buyer of equipment. It is no longer relevant. And it paradoxically, it exists today to deal with the very risks it creates. And so the Biden administration position is, is puzzling because on the one hand, everyone acknowledges that Ukraine is not going to join NATO, at least anytime soon. There was this formal commitment to that possibility in 2008 that the US made along with other NATO partners that Ukraine would join, but yet everyone involved, including the Biden administration, acknowledges that that's not going to happen. But yet they insist that the option remain open. open. They say that Russia doesn't have the right to tell Ukraine what alliances to join or not join. So how would you respond to that argument that Russia is trying to dictate to Ukraine something that it has no right to do, which is what military alliances it can join? Well, on uh, offer at this moment, possibly, is plays with that in the context of this Minsk agreement we can talk about. But that there be a moratorium, that Ukraine not join. By the way, Ukraine could not join today by the very NATO charter, which has provisions for territorial integrity and economic issues. NATO, NATO would not accept Ukraine if it kind of loped down the street and said, hi, I want to be a member. So it's kind of a delusional play. But the moratorium possibility, I think, is one that is a compromise and uh, would allow Ukraine to focus on stability, the economy, uh, its democratic institutions looking toward joining without Russia having a say. So that is something that's been put forward, I think, in some of the, if not official, but alternative proposals for negotiation. Well, you I wanted to ask you about this great op-ed that you wrote in the Washington Post called The Exit from the Ukraine Crisis is Hiding in Plain Sight. Can you talk about what, what that exit is, which you sure. lay out? And then, you know, in fact, on the evenings before posting my column, you go back and forth with the copy editors, and it was a little bit more aggressive in terms of it's hiding in plain sight. I mean, I think it's there to be retrieved and lifted up. But so in 2015, Germany, France, Ukraine, and Russia came together in this Minsk agreement, which provided, began to provide for an independent Ukraine with an autonomous Eastern part of the country sovereign borders, demilitarized, and it had potential. The, the governments involved at that time, with the exception of Putin, are no longer the same leaders. So you don't have the Poroshenko chocolate oligarch, who I believe is indicted. You have Zelensky, 
who uh, ran on an anti-war platform, by the way, and then many of the nationalist extreme forces who really control a lot of Ukrainian politics stepped in. Hollande was French president. Macron is now the president, stepping down in a few weeks, which is possibly hopeful because he wants to be de Gaulle. And then you have a new German government where, sadly, I don't think the Greens are as helpful as just the Social Democrats. And you have, of course, Nord Stream this. But so they gathered. There was some compromise. The uh, Russians and the Ukrainians reneged under pressure within their own political system. It is now back on offer. Uh, and it is more possible. They've had uh, eight hour meetings in Paris about two weeks ago. They have another session slated this coming week in Berlin. And I think what's at stake is higher stakes than was the case even in 2015. By the way, Samantha Power at the time, who was at the UN, said it was the most hopeful possible. Blinken has praised it. The UN and the EU endorsed it. But it is about a non aligned, independent Ukraine, sovereign borders, protection for Russian speakers. So there's a lot of protections and there's a lot of give and take. And if you had really creative, persistent diplomacy, you could see some way forward. What's difficult, I think, right now in your media people, we all are, but the idea of patience is not a great <laughs> uh, factor. Not very clear. In our, nor, you know, nor is context, nor is history. So diplomacy is on a timeline. And sometimes diplomacy, by the way, I think is overstated. It has to be with a political edge. Uh, diplomacy, just to be a mirror of something alternative to military is not the way. But I think diplomacy and Aaron can, has gotten a bad rap. It's so often, uh, so often associated with appeasement and um, non-action. And the reach for the military so quickly is always viewed as hard headed. And so it's a dangerous moment. And the nuclear issue we haven't even talked about, you've got two nuclear countries faced to, you know, possibly uh, there've been other incidents in the last 40, 50, 60 years, but the Cuban Missile Crisis comes to mind too. And that was back channel diplomacy. And I don't, one hopes there's constructive back channel diplomacy because it's not clear in terms of those involved if there would be. Can you just clarify what you mean when you said diplomacy isn't enough? I think it has to be political too. Yeah, I mean, what in the sense that, that, you know, sometimes more sloganing, sloganeering messaging, people will say, we're, you know, diplomacy. And what that means can be a mask for machinations behind the scene that, in fact, what is the balance right now between diplomacy and deterrence? Sending 3,000 troops, is that going to facilitate? I personally think, by the way, the troops are more for bargaining chip purposes, maybe with Putin. I think the really dangerous stuff, we're shipping, uh, we've shipped almost $3 billion since 2014. And we don't even know how many advisors are in Ukraine training a possible Ukrainian insurgency. And if there was a blunder or an accident, if there was a US advisor on the front lines, I think that's the trigger and that's very scary. And could be, as I said, you, if you're doing diplomacy, there has to be some commitment to it. If you're going to do over deterrence, it undermines diplomacy, as does sanctions often. You know, on those troops, um, the Pentagon spokesperson, John Kirby, he said that these troops are not going to fight in Ukraine. That's off the table. But he said they're going to send a message that NATO matters. That's what he said. And I was thinking if I was a soldier and I was being forced to leave my family and the reason is I'm being used as a PR tool to show that NATO matters. Like, I you know, I think I was on a call the other, and someone said, you know, is this wouldn't this be good for Biden, you know, to get some military action going, like with his sinking poll ratings? I think, you know, and not to be cruel about Ukraine, but it is not a vital national security interest. That sounds hardcore, but it is for Russia. I mean, it's a deeply asymmetric relationship. And you're absolutely right, Aaron. I mean, I think in a time when people are sick of endless wars, we've just come out of Afghanistan and we've seen what that insurgency looked like. The idea of pivoting could really, I think, hurt. Uh, well, it would be tra traumatic uh, for people and families. And by the way, there are 15,000 civilian casualties already recorded and there may well be more in, in Ukraine. That is kind of stunning to say that out loud. You guys are and, gonna be used for symbolic value. 
and yeah. bollock fodder. But you know, it's a terrible thing to say, but that has been, if you think back to Vietnam and also the kind of fetish with credibility, what does credibility mean? But you know, men and women were sent to fight the domino effect. Right. They were sent to fight communism, to fight communists. And, you know, there was a kind of, you know, incentive and there was enough fear and communists had been sufficiently demonized that there was a purpose. But right now, NATO, an institution, by the way, which has not been very kind to ordinary people in many countries for looting. You're, you're being very kind to NATO and putting <laughs> phrasing it like that. <laughs> Diplomacy, right. I mean, but I, I just I guess I'm just surprised that they said that part out loud. You know, it's the type of thing that like a war, an anti-war critic, like you could see Chomsky saying, like, the only purpose of this is to show that NATO matters it's, or something, but they're actually no. saying it. I mean, the spokespeople, Jen Psaki, I mean, it's there. No wonder the Ukrainian president the other day was kind of concerned about the bellicose talk from Biden and his people that it might hurt the economy. I want to ask you about that because I'm curious, who are the main forces that are pressuring Zelensky to abandon his platform? You mentioned that when he ran, he got a huge margin of support from the Ukrainian public, bringing together both sides, you know, those who um, identify strongly with the West and those who identify strongly with Russia. It's a very divided country, yeah. but he won a huge margin of support running on a pro-peace platform yeah, and he was going to right. implement the Minsk Accords and, and the the basic bargain of Minsk, as I understand it, is that the Donbass, this region, have autonomy where for protection for Russian it has autonomy. Speakers. Yes, so it has autonomy, and, and in return, they demilitarize, so they're no longer a military threat to the central Kiev government. But Zelensky has done the opposite of what he campaigned on. I'm just wondering, you mentioned the domestic forces Absolutely. at play. So, so if me, you talk let, about that, yeah. and, and also also the pressure he's been put under by the U.S. I mean, they must be a factor too in his Absolutely. in his delaying. The implementation of Minsk. So let me just say briefly. I don't think people know this, but it was it it is a civil war. It's, and in the in the case of then President Poroshenko, people in the East were treated as terrorists, and there was little shooting. Your brother, or sister, the Western Ukrainians armed shot many of the casualties. So it's it's a horrifying situation. But Zelensky. So Zelensky is a famous comedian. I mean, there's a show in Russia called, God, it's like uh, Monty Python meets Saturday Night Live. And he was the star of it. So he comes in, he's played a president on TV. He has no real experience, except he's winning and he's not Poroshenko oligarch. But the forces, and Aaron knows this, I talked to our friend Lev Galinkin the other night, who is an expert on neo-Nazism in Ukraine over these last decades. The right-wing nationalist forces, from the beginning in 2013, 14, have been very powerful and the oligarchs. So that factor has not permitted Zelensky a free hand. And they're powerful in the Rada, which is the Ukrainian parliament. They're powerful in terms of that, you know, in connecting to certain groups which have power. The oligarchs, as I said, the East has never had much political power. So I think. Biden, when he was vice president, I don't know if you know this, at one point said he talked to Poroshenko more than his wife. <laughs> he was literally pro-consul to Ukraine, and he was very involved to the point where he lectured the anti-corruption bureau to be more active. Corruption, listen, it's in Russia, there's corruption. Ukraine is on a smaller scale, even more corrupt because they never had a reckoning of any kind with their oligarchs. You had one in Russia and then a new class was created. He is not his own person. What's interesting is that you do understand their forces in Ukraine other than Zelensky. And just very briefly, it's often the case that in this country, people think Putin does everything. He has his own blob. There are constellation of forces. The New York Times finally wrote a piece last week about the three hardliners around Putin. I mean, he has his extremists, the military, those in the eastern part of Ukraine who formed a republic, you know, the Donetsk Republic, or I forget, Donbass Republic, who've wanted to break off. And there's been an attempt to tamp that down. In any case, by Putin, uh, Putin. By, by Putin yeah. for, yeah, they don't want to. By the way, there's an, an economic factor here, too. First of all, there is a reason Zelensky's worried about his economy. But, you know, it's it sounds so silly, but 
Putin doesn't really, I mean, he has pension problems and poverty problems in Russia. On a crass level, he doesn't want to take on a whole, you know, whole new social safety net program. I, he's writ, talked about that anyway. But it, the Ukrainian landscape is a very uh, difficult one and very have, has different forces. I do think he, Zelensky is in a better place now to participate in Minsk than Poroshenko was, who in himself was a cor- corruption factor. And what stopped Minsk from being implemented, the Minsk Accord? Time, in the sense that it, it wasn't clear how long this would go on, the stakes. It hadn't been geopoliticized, the civil war, as much. And uh, Ukraine and Russia reneged. And there's also, who goes first, right? Do the separatists leave before there's escalation or before there's negotiation? Or, you know, the timing of these things. I don't know the details, but I do think that there's more energy in that process than there was in 2015. I think the reason why the U.S. has been reluctant to put any pressure on Ukraine to implement Minsk is because if you give the Donbass autonomy, even though that would lead in the spirit of the deal to demilitarize the Donbass, it also would give the Donbass basically a veto over NATO membership for Ukraine because that's As true. an autonomous region, it can block that. Well, it's blocking it now because just the civil war is not permitted. But the other factor is, um, you know, it's a voting block. Eastern Ukraine was not supportive of the Kiev candidates. I mean, you, it's much more autonomously pro-Russian. And I, I know that sounds odd, but many of my our Russian friends had a, a mother-in-law or a, you know family. It's it's different than Eastern European countries joining NATO. It's different than Georgia. Ukraine is culturally, but that doesn't mean you don't pursue these. It means you pursue these agreements uh, because of the, as I said, I, I think the accidental piece of this is the most horrifying. And to hear the rest of the interview, please go to usefulidiots.substack.com. Well, that, that was really great. I always love hearing her. She's one of the few voices that's, you know, non-belligerent voices who manages to still be printed at places like the Washington Post. She'll get on MSNBC. It's very rare to see someone uh, with her perspective penetrate those dark <laughs> places. Well, she's so informed, she's so experienced, and she has yeah. such dignity and poise, even in the face of, you know, so many attacks that came her and Steve's way, especially during during Russiagate. And, uh, you know, one of many reasons to admire Katrina. And what's cool about her at The Nation magazine, where I wrote for a while, you know, there really is genuine debate, unlike so many other media spaces. They do actually publish, you know, people who identify on the left, but who have really divergent views on many yeah. issues. And I just, she's always, no matter her own personal views on a topic, she's always stuck to her mission to keep the nation as a space for debate. So even when like her employees were like attacking her husband, Steve, uh, she would still, you know, she wouldn't retaliate. She would give right. them space to say whatever they wanted. And it's like, it's a rare instance of someone being committed to genuine debate. And it's, you know, it's what helps make the nation the important institution that it is. Watching Steve, I mean, she's much more dip, not diplomat. No, she's she's not doesn't have the edge, um, which is great that Steve had. But they're both incredibly elegant. Yes, you know, he was a bit. He was a bit. I don't want to say meaner, like more cutting, more. Cu- yeah. he was more cutting. But yeah. they both are so elegant in their responses to just utter buffoonery. Yes. Um, and you just can hear that they are the ones, you know, when you hear them talking with people, they're the ones who are being reasonable and driven by reflecting and questioning as opposed to this knee jerk, ideological, jingoistic, Absolutely. totally like emotional drivel that comes Absolutely. from their critics. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. They're haters. It was it's such a satisfying video to watch because he just totally calls out. He just nailed, I mean, I was so impressed how in real time he manages to respond to this idiot who's totally, you know, like red baiting him, even though obviously the irony of that is that, you know, Poon is no communist, but the same kind of McCarthyite smearing defamation guilt by association and, you know, 
someone like Max Boot thought he'd get away with that somehow. Thought that would did he think that calling him a Russia apologist would like silence him or throw him off his? Well, that's all he can do. That's, that's all he can because right, he, right, he can't challenge can't Steve on the facts. On the substance. You, you know what's funny? Just compare their like comportment, their their emotional energy. Yeah. Like even putting aside what they say, like Max Boot is like he's kind of quivering. He yeah. sounds scared. You know, they're right. attacking us. Yeah. And Steve has a certain just grace and calm. Right. And that comes from having the facts on his side. Right. And not being driven by like inadequacy because like, and what, like, what kind of a person would want to encourage war with Russia and deem whatever Russia was accused of, of hacking emails and putting out some social media memes, deem that an attack. Talk about it in warlike terms. Right. Like a really kind of uh, person who feels I think inadequate and scared of the world and thus needs to create enemies to feel, I guess, a certain sense of, of power. And so that's why Max Boot just looks so emotionally uncomfortable. And Steve, you know, has a certain poise to him that, um, you know, his detractors can never have because they don't have the facts on their side and they're driven by something completely divorced from reality and from basic decency. Yeah. I mean, it is also incredible. Like when, people would call out Trump for being soft on Putin, which of course, as you pointed out repeatedly, he wasn't, if you compare him to Obama um, on many, in many fronts. But I would always be like, what do you want? You say this guy is Cheeto Mussolini, unhinged, dementia, erratic, unprecedented threat to the world order. We have nuclear weapons. Russia has nuclear weapons. You say Putin is evil, untrustworthy. What do you want to have happen? You want Cheeto Mussolini to be saber rattling? What's the end game? I guess it is just arms weapons sales. That's all it is. It's just a racket. And I guess some kind of rah rah USA go USA and yeah. And a good distraction from, as you pointed out, the privilege protection racket. So that way that the Clintonites, Clinton and Clintonites and the what is it, the consultant, um, industrial complex didn't have to look at their own role in losing to trump and of course the democrats you know try to distract from all their failures by just turning everything into russia 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 yeah i mean everyone in power wins even trump trump wins with his opponents focused on russia because they're not talking about what trump is actually doing both with russia and escalating tensions and tearing up nuclear accords as trump did and tearing up vital arms control uh, and Democrats win because they don't have to look honestly at the policies that caused them to lose to Trump, nor have to come up with a policy alternative. So, right. and if, and the media wins because we're not talking about um, real issues. We're right. talking about a, a fantasy soap opera, where uh, you know spy thriller, where Trump is controlled by Putin. So everybody wins who's in power, no matter what side of the aisle they're on, and, and everybody right. outside of that loses because we have it, an encouragement and escalated tensions with Russia which then leads to crises like this we're seeing right now with Ukraine. And of course, you know, all this money gets diverted into into war and buying up weapons instead of providing for people's basic needs, which is another area where Democrats and Republicans are have a lot in common. They don't really right. want to give people the basic necessities that everyone needs to have a decent life. Right. And then Trump also can point, seems almost like a victim to his followers. Yeah, right? it's and the ultimate Fox News viewer fantasy. Like it really is. this conspiracy, this like idea that liberals are always plotting to take down, you know, their like hero right. Republicans like Trump. In this case, it actually, as I say often, with Russiagate, it did come true. There was actually a plot, yeah. uh, a nefarious plot using the intelligence uh, community to uh, go after Trump instead of taking him on policy wise. To try to paint him as a Russian puppet. So it was the perfect storm and it only benefited people in power, no matter what side of the aisle that they were on. Right. It's funny because there are people I know who aren't very, you know, they're not that pit- politically connected. They don't follow politics that well, but they totally just, you know, the, the Democratic obsession with Russia just didn't pass the smell test. Like everyone mm-hmm. could tell it was just a, a, a yeah. desperate attempt. Well, guys, thank you so much for uh, watching Useful Idiots. Please subscribe to us on YouTube at youtube.com slash Useful Idiots. Please rate and review us on iTunes so that the terrorists, a.k.a. um, the Lincoln Project or Pod Save America, uh, don't win and get higher ratings than us. We can't let that happen, guys. Uh, Please join our Substack. Uh, That's uh, usefulidiots.substack.com. You get great uh, bonus content this week. You get a great chat with... um, 
Aaron Mate about uh, a major story that he just did, the type of story that wins him awards as we talk about in our in our Substack only chat. We also talked to uh, Katrina Vanden Heuvel about uh, her experiences in the Soviet Union and about her late husband, Stephen Cohen, and how he was able to punch back uh, elegantly at uh, people like neocon Max Boot, who tried to smear him in a very McCarthyite transparent way. So you'll definitely want to join for that. And of course, you get our Monday morning dispatches uh, podcast version of our Monday morning streams if you are a Substack subscriber. Smash the like button and like the smash button. Hello, thank you so much for listening to and watching Useful Idiots. For full episodes and extended interviews, please subscribe at usefulidiots.substack.com. You can subscribe on YouTube at youtube.com slash usefulidiots for clips, live streams, and full episodes. Also, subscribe to us wherever you find your podcast. Follow us on Twitter at usefulidiotpod and use the hashtag usefulidiotspod. Join us Mondays at 10 a.m. for the Useful Idiots Monday Morning Show, where we discuss the Sunday morning news shows so you don't have to watch them. 